All right. Um, welcome back, everybody. This is Erica Hornthal with another episode of Dance Therapy Dialogues. And I'm super excited about the conversation that we're having today because, like you guys know, not all the conversations, in fact, most of the conversations are not around dance therapy. It's just I'm the dance therapist having the conversations. Um, but I'm really excited about our conversation today because it's actually our first venture into fitness, um, talking more around like movement and we'll talk a little bit about bodybuilding with our guest. Um, and um, well, before I go into any further, I'm gonna allow our guest to introduce herself. So Jacqueline, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, um, my name is Jacqueline Baker. I'm an IFBB fitness Olympian. And I currently live in New York City training as a personal trainer, both in person and virtually. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, what an IFBB Fitness Olympian is, it's the International Federation of Bodybuilding. And Olympia is basically the Super Bowl of bodybuilding. So it's the highest competition you can compete at as a bodybuilder. Um, and so that's what I do. I compete in the fitness division professionally, and then I train uh, in the city. And then um, I danced professionally for 10 years. So I have a dance background, extensive dance background. And I think that's pretty much, pretty much me. <laughs> that's awesome. So like for context, um, so I feel like, I mean, Jacqueline and I, well, I guess I should say I, I didn't grow up in Tampa Bay, but that's how we met, right? right. Like, um, I know you and your family danced at a studio that I was finally able to kind of find my way into, which was nice because when I first moved to Florida, I didn't know anyone or anything. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Um, like Mary Jo's was like a second home for a while in, in different ways. Cause I didn't spend a lot of time there, but it was very, um, inviting. And I just have some really fond memories about like dancing and performing. I, I think, was it, um, I don't know. We all auditioned for, um, Bye Bye Birdie. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were like 11, I don't know, 10, I don't know. I think I was like eight grade-ish so okay so maybe we're a little bit older I don't even like, remember yeah like junior high-ish yeah. yeah it was such a creative time though and so um I was just saying like before we started recording that um it's been nice to like reconnect with friends or sometimes just acquaintances you know that like you used to be very familiar with right or kind of run into in the same circles and to follow people's paths as they grow up I think is for me, one of the exciting things about Facebook, <laughs> one of the exciting things about social media. I agree. And then like, I like to take it off of, of the platform and actually talk to people. So um, I know like you grew up dancing and um, I would love for you to just talk a little bit about your journey into dance, into maybe fitness, into training, and then certainly into like this world of competitive bodybuilding. Sure. How, did that, how did that happen? Uh, so I went to Mary Joe's with you and I was a very competitive dancer, um, was in, instead of summer camp, I went to ballet programs, I was competing all the time. Um, and then after high school, I went on to University of Arizona for dance and uh, majored in dance, so I have a BFA from there in dance. And while I was there, I double majored in science. I knew I went, liked science, I knew I, I thought I kind of wanted to be a physical therapist, wasn't really sure. Um, two weeks after I graduated, my sister was living here in the city, so I moved here with her and just started auditioning and pursuing my dance career. And I did what all dancers do. We did table, I didn't wait tables, but I did bartending, I did hostessing, got a couple of gigs here and there. I danced for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Um, I danced for a couple of companies, actually uh, Miranda Davis's company who went to Mary Jo's also, I ended up dancing for her. I danced for another contemporary company here in the city um, called Synthesis Dance, which mm -hmm. is Tracy Stanfield's company. Yeah. And then, um, so I danced for about a little under 10 years. And during that, I was looking for something else to do as far as income was concerned. And I didn't want to be in the bars anymore because I wasn't able to audition in the mornings because I was up till five in the morning. Yeah. Um, so I knew I liked science. So there was a gym near me that was hiring personal trainers and you or hiring people to train them to become personal trainers. You didn't have to have any background, but I had the science and dance background. So they kind of fast tracked me towards a personal trainer. And that was in 2008. And I became certified and started training. Mm -hmm. And then I was still dancing at the time. 
So I did it part-time and I did a lot of other things in between there. I was a real estate agent. I uh, taught kids gymnastics. I taught dance. And then I had an injury and I kind of thought, well, I've done enough dancing. I, this is the end here. And that was in 2014. That was in 2010. I had my injury. So about 2013, 14, I was like, okay, it's time to do something else. Maybe I'll go back to school. And I was kind of just in this in limbo. Didn't really know. I always joked of what I wanted to be when I grow up. So I was like, hmm, what's next? And I was in a gym working out that had a pool because of my injury. So I was swimming and just happened to be the gym that I worked at 10 years prior. And um, my now coach approached me and asked me if I had ever thought about competing in bodybuilding. And people had always told me I would be good. And it kind of goes back to Mary Jo's. When I was there, I was always very muscular mm. to the point that some of my teachers told me not to do push-ups, to be careful with my arms because they don't want them to get too what they said bulky, which is a word that I really dislike. Really? Um, yeah. So I was nixed from push-ups. But it became my own doing also because I thought I was too muscular, so I shouldn't do them, which is a common misconception. Um, so anyway, he approached me. I did a lot of research about him and if I wanted to do it, should I train with him or, you know, and I knew a lot about the bodybuilding world. I had been approached before and people had told me that I would do really well in it. And I was like, Meh. and so I decided, I don't know really what I'm doing right now anyway. Um, so let's give it a go. So I trained with him for six months, competed in my first uh, competition and won both my categories. Um, and so from then on, it was hooked. So you're like, hmm, I, maybe I should <laughs> keep doing this. I was like, yes, I'm good at this. And it gave me another, another um, avenue to get on stage. And I love being on stage anyway. Um, so at that point, I was competing in the figure division. Um, in, in bodybuilding, there's men and women, and there's different divisions in each on each side, um, mm -hmm. depending on level of muscularity and how lean you are and how much body fat you carry. Um, so I was in figure, which is like the middle of the road, but there was a fitness division mm -hmm. and the fitness division is the same physique, but you do a gymnastics dance routine, fitness routine. Okay. So when my coach found out my dance back more about my dance background, he was like, why don't we try fitness? So the next year I competed in, um, figure and fitness and won. And there's different levels of competition, just like there is for dancing. So there's regional, national, and then professional. Mm -hmm. So I won the national level in fitness and turned professional. And that was in 2017. Wow. So from 2015 to 17, I competed at an amateur level. 2017, I turned professional. And then from then I competed as a professional for the past three years. That's so cool. That's so incredible too. Like that, like you said, like Olympia is like the Super Bowl, right? Of bodybuilding. Right. So, I mean, to go from, eh, maybe I'll try this to like, now I'm like at the top of my game with people that have right. probably been doing it for a lot longer is really cool. I mean, it's just like, yeah, you know, I, I, I can thank my coach for that. I can thank Mary Jo's and my dance background for all the discipline and, you know, the kind of very focus mentality that I have. I always go back to my dance and my ballet training. Yeah. Um, but it has been very surreal. I did, I did jump the ranks pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> but you know, I worked hard for it. So I can pat myself on the back for that. Yeah. And I mean, whether like anybody that's watching, whether you're into bodybuilding, train yourself, are into exercise or fitness, like I, I mean, you should still go regardless of that, whether you do it for yourself or interest interested, like you should totally follow Jacqueline just because her, I think I enjoy watching not, not just, or not necessarily like when you're getting ready to compete, but like the lessons behind the competition. Like, yeah. um, I remember a long time ago, you, and I think you've posted this since, but you were very early on one to talk about how like your desire to change has to be desired than greater than your desire to stay the same. Yep. And that always resonated with me because I talk about that with clients from a mental health perspective, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, and from a movement perspective. So if you really don't have the intrinsic motivation to make changes and it's just other people telling you, oh, you'll be healthier. Oh, you'll fit better in your clothes. Oh, you're born for this. Oh, you'll be a natural. Unless it comes from within, you can make the changes, but they're not going to stick, right. you know? 
So that always resonated with me. And I, I always appreciate like the lessons behind the training. I appreciate um, that. I really do. Yeah. I think that's a big piece. Like how much of that is goes into not your personal training, but like the people that you personally train, right? Like not, not your training as a, right. as a bodybuilder, right. but how much of it is mindset and how much do you like coach your own clients through that training? I think just a lot. I always say it's mind over matter. I always say mind game strong. You know, I have these little phrases that I try to just like, you know, there are times with my clients that I'm like, you just don't want it bad enough. And that's okay. Right. It's yeah. totally okay. But you just have to say to yourself, I don't really want it that bad. And if you don't, then, then they, then your goals will align. If your goals outweigh how much you actually want it, you're always going to be failing at your goals, which I hate to use that word, but you can't set goals that you really don't want deep down inside. Right. Or that are for you. you know? Right. So like, who told you, you want that goal? You know, Correct. Who, who is that Correct. goal for? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think there's so much, obviously there's so much overlap in just dance and fitness. I mean, even yeah. when we were saying, excuse me, from like an early age when people were like, oh, don't do more of that. You'll look to this, yeah. you know, or there are these constraints and limitations that we put around dance, like, you know, how long we can do it, how we right. look doing it, you know, the perfect body, this and that. I think that's why that's probably one of the main reasons I went into movement therapy, because it was like, I knew that I didn't have the body type, right. the look, the technique, the skill, but I had the heart, right? It was like, I love connecting to movement and then finding a way to do that in another way, you know, whether it's through science or mental health or personal training, like, um, how do you think dance has helped get you to this point outside of like the physicality of it? Like, what did it teach you that kind of helped you to keep going, keep moving and, and finding new ways of just, you know, living? <laughs> I think it always boils down to my discipline. I think that I can really, I can thank my dance training for that mm -hmm. um, because I feel good when I move. I always remind myself how I feel after. So like, if I'm just feeling like, I mm, really want to do it today, I'm like, but I'll feel better after. Or mm -hmm. um, I try to say, like, just get there, just get it done. Like, I tell my clients that a lot. I'm like, not every workout has to be, like, the best workout of your life, but just get in there, meaning the gym, get it, get in, get out. Yeah. Get in, do five exercises and leave. So I think my dance training gave me the ability to almost just do it. Like people say to me, I, I, some people who may follow me know I wake up really early and I work out or I wake up really early just because I just do when I get out of bed, I pop out of bed, but people are always like, how did you do that? And I'm like, well, I, I don't have an answer for it. I just do it. <laughs> right. I really don't have, like, I really just get up and go. Um, so I think my dance training set me up for that, set me up for success in life with that. And, um, and to keep me moving. I have to say also my parents have always instilled movement in us. Um, mm -hmm. They work out. I remember waking up for high school, seeing my mom working out every morning. So I think that what you're around also makes who you are. And if you, if you surround yourself around people who are constantly moving and exercising and eating healthy, then the, those are going to become your habits also. Yeah, they translate for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it makes me think too, like when, you, like when people are like, how do you do that? Like, how do you wake up so early? Um, I think also like, it sounds like you play to what's natural for you, right? right. Like how, how many of us have to set the alarm to wake up early? And then it, sometimes it feels like just added movement in a day that we already don't want to do it, you know? So right. like, I'm not really a morning person. That's kind of changed just because I have little people that wake me up early, <laughs> but like- Right. If I didn't, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm like eight 30, nine o'clock yeah. ideally would be something like the time. But you I probably would... go to bed later. <laughs> right. I do. I'm such a night owl. Yeah. You um, know, like I instilled certain disciplines in my life. Like I put my phone away at nine or nine 30 every night. Yeah. I put it in my kitchen on the other side of, the, of my apartment. You know, I use a real alarm clock to wake up. So my phone's not by me. So yeah. there's certain things that I, I guess set myself up to be more of a morning person. 
Right. Absolutely. Like everything is, everything's laid out for me the night before all my breakfast, you like everything I would need to make breakfast is all laid out the night before. Yeah. So no. And I think that plays a big part, you know, it's like yeah. in not just how badly you want something, but you make the accommodations depending on how, how much you want it, but also how, how, um, accessible it is. Right. Like, right if I'm forcing myself to do this and after 30 days, two months, three months, it's still really difficult. Then like, re, like you said, reevaluate your goals. You well, said yeah. your, like your clients, when you're like, I can see you don't really want this the way I want it for you. Let's just right. talk about that. Right. <laughs> right. right. Or I say to them, I can't want your goals for you more than you do. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't, I, you know, but I also work with people, like you said, about finding what works for you. Like, I can't tell you how many people come to me and say they want their goal is to lose weight or to get, you know, to look better, feel better. And they look, but I can't run. Mm. And then I look at them and I don't like to compare myself, but I'm like, I've never run in a day in my life. <laughs> right. I'm not a runner. And people have this like idea that they have to be in the gym three hours or they have to run or they, you know, have to do something in order to be fit. And that's not really the reality. Yeah. You can do whatever you want that makes you feel good. Right. I'm so glad that you brought that up because, um, I talk about this a lot and, and mostly cause so my background up until, I don't know, maybe five years ago was mostly working with older adults, you know, so talk about a population that has the camp mentality, like right. we're not supposed to do this as we age, we're not supposed to do that, you know, um, oh, you don't walk with a cane. Oh, that's a mate. You know I mean? And yet I think really more people are aging better than aren't, but that's not the stigma. That's not right. what we see. Right. So I, I would have that too. Like I'd walk into a nursing home when I was, you know, supposed to be meeting like a group of, of people on like the memory impairment floor. And instead of like, hello, nice to meet you. Here are our residents. It was always like, hi, so this is Sally. She's, you know, she's blind. This person's paralyzed. This person has the, like all the limitations and then they're like, oh, and why are you here? I'm like, oh, I'm here to do dance and dance therapy with them. And they were, they were like, these people don't walk. How are they supposed to dance? Okay, let's stop putting what it should be. And let's just allow them to do what they can, you know? Right. So right. same thing. Like if a client comes and they're like, well, I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do this. Like, what do you do? Like, how right. do you move? Right. What makes you want to do this work? Yeah. And kind of start there. I, I, I imagine like you've had clients that even maybe come in, say I'm not a runner. And then all of a sudden they're the runners in the group. Like, does that yeah, they're, Or they're like, I just decided to try it. Like, <laughs> right. Well, right. You're like, you know, okay, like, tell like, me how that goes. Uh, don't do too much. Cause you're not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like I always say, like I could dance for hours. I, I just don't have the stamina of a runner in me. And I've tried, I've actually like gotten on the treadmill, tried to condition myself to it. I just don't enjoy it. I don't get into that. Like, I don't understand runners high. Running <laughs> I've ever done or like sprints, which people think that's probably nuts, but like that feels better to me than to run. I've never, honestly, I don't think I've ever run more than two minutes. Yeah. Unless well, I, I would say like, I don't run unless like someone's basketball. chasing me. Like I don't exactly. run unless my life depends on it. And so, even then I don't know how fast or, or how long I can run. Fast right. I can run, not long. Right. So right. if I can get away quickly, I'll be good. There you go. So I, mean, yeah. I think like you speaking to, you know, this can't versus like what's possible, you know? Right. Um, and even for your, from your perspective, you know, or like your journey where people were like, no, I think you could do this. You should, you know? And just seeing what's possible, you know, and trying it. And then all of a sudden, like kind of getting hooked because right. there's a natural propensity <laughs> there. Yeah, exactly. Well, kind of my personality, a little bit of an extremist. I think another thing that people often say is I have to do this. Yeah. And I always say I get to do it. Oh, I love that. Uh, thank you. I, I don't think I made it up, but I do use it. Um, I just think like, I, like you said, all those people who are blind or in a wheelchair or this or that, I think I get to work out. I don't ever say I have to work out. Yeah. I may, you say I'm going to work out. I'm, um, yeah, like I, I'm about to work out, but I never say I have to. Cause to me, if I, if, if, I think people put have to in a negative box. Yeah. Or like someone will say to me, you have to eat again. And I'm like, no, I get to eat again. <laughs> right, right. I like it. Yeah. So I think that 
flip also really helps with my clients. Yeah. And I, I never, I mean, I that makes so much sense. I never really thought of it in those terms, but how many times and how yeah. often do we do that with ex exercise, right? People are like, All the time. Yeah. I'm going to go out later tonight, <laughs> post COVID. Um, you know, I'm going to have a lot to drink or I will really want to eat, you know, whatever. So I have to go work out first. Right. And it already puts that negative connotation. Yep. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to reframe that for myself. Yeah, yeah, it's a good thought, <laughs> so, honestly, it really does. And you're right, like, it, I mean, I do the same thing too, where, I mean, I am not, you know, in the fitness world by any means, but I recognize how I feel after I move. And from my perspective, like, it just changes my mood. It just changes right. my mental health. So, well, it's science. Yeah, you know, yeah, for you not, to just, you feel, will feel better. Right, right. I mean, obviously the endorphins and, right. and the adrenaline. And, um, I think just like moving our bodies from a different place, if we're already feeling down or depressed or low, it's not going to make you feel worse. Right. If you do it from that authentic place of kind of meeting yourself where you are, like you said, like, don't go right. run a marathon. Unless you're, unless you're trying <laughs> to run and you're not a runner because right. you, you had to run. Right. Then you're that's really just not, that's not, that's where people I think yo-yo exercise and yo-yo, I guess I would say diet. I don't really like that word, but yeah. I think that's where people kind of get into this habit is because they're doing what they think they have to do. Right. As opposed to what feels good to them and what makes them feel better. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, th I think like kind of also speaking to what you said earlier, where it was like, we, um, Kind of throw ourselves into things right so instead of because i mean today and in, in today's day and age everything seems to be like instant gratification right yeah. so if i'm going to see results they're going to be quick and if right. i don't see them quickly then i'm out of here as yeah. opposed to like a sustained practice you know maybe that's a slow build up and i guess i see that a lot in how you come down from your competitions right like how yeah. you how you how do you put it um not detrain yeah yeah, yeah. Um, can you yeah. talk, talk about that? Like, what is it, what's the importance of, um, you know, slowly coming down from a competition? How does, how, how did, like, was that new for you? Was that a different right. way of looking so at it? I guess we have to talk about going into the competition a little bit first and then sure. turning off it. So going into a competition, I decrease my food and increase my cardio, okay. which in turn decreases my body fat. So there's a science behind it because I can't just lose weight because weight could be muscle, it could be water, it could be body fat. Mm -hmm. So I have to keep my muscle and lose just body fat. And that's a challenge. That's why there's certain types of food and certain timings and things of that sort, which are much more complicated than this conversation. But for yeah, basic I mean, terms, um, I mean, it's a science, like you said, yeah, so. exactly. I increase my cardio depending on what my body looks like and decrease my food. And so I get to a point where my body's dropping body fat really, really quickly, which can alter your metabolism. Mm -hmm. Then we go into a show, we dehydrate for the show, which is not the healthiest, um, but it's just for that day of the show, which I can drop anywhere from, this is why when people say they dropped weight, I'm like, what kind of weight? <laughs> um, I can drop anywhere from five to eight pounds in those two days of dehydrating Wow. on stage. So then reversing out of that, Mm -hmm. is what you have to be careful about. Number one, for your heart, because you have dehydrated. So we slowly start introducing water and sodium. I keep my sodium high, but depending on what my body's responding to, you have to increase your sodium levels and your water levels at the same time to level back out. Once I level out there, then we slowly increase my food and slowly decrease my cardio to get to what's called a maintenance level. Mm -hmm. um, and what that does is I slowly put body fat back on. If you don't do that process of what's called reverse dieting and you just start eating more and decreasing your cardio or stop your cardio completely and just start eating a bunch of cake and cookies because you feel like you deserve it or you've been right. dieting for so long or you're so lean. Or... There are people who put on a good... 12 to 15 pounds in like two to three weeks. Um, to me, it's very unhealthy for your heart. Um, it's very unhealthy for your brain. Yeah. I don't think it's good practice as a fitness professional. Um, and to be vain, I don't like the way I look 
when I'm like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I slowly reverse, you know, people always ask me, so when are you going to eat whatever you want? <laughs> and I always, I say I eat whatever I want 365 days a year. Mm. I don't, you know, I don't dislike anything I eat. I don't um, boil chicken with no seasoning or eat plain broccoli or celery or whatever. I, I like my food. I just keep it a little bit cleaner at certain times and have less of it at certain times. And, um, and then I indulge when I can and when I want to. Well, that speaks to like that same mentality of I have to, like, I yeah. have to do this versus right. I get to, right? Like right. I well, get to do this so I can compete, right? I, I right. get to be on stage. So these are the things that I'm going to do to get to that place right. versus like, oh, tonight I get to have X, Y, Z, right? Correct. So it is, it's a different mentality instead of like a punishment, right? right. Like, so when well, you get to have some fun. Some people really think what I do is like masochistic, you know, like I'm, I have to, sometimes there are weddings when I have to bring food to the wedding and mm -hmm. eat out of a plastic bag. And people are like, why would you ever do that? Or I have to wake up at four in the morning to do cardio. And they think, you know, and I'm like, well, I, like I just said, I get to do it. I choose to do it. It's right. not a punishment. No one is forcing me to do this. I choose to, I love it. I find it fascinating. I find it exhilarating, you know, to see your body change and to reach a goal that most people won't do or can't do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I think it just adds to the conversation around like, what, what can dancers do? Right? Yes. Like yes. it's not just dance for 10 years and retire and then sit behind a desk. I mean, yeah. not that every dancer is capable of being a bodybuilder and or wants to be, but I mean, let's think longevity, right? Like, let's think out of the box. Also, which I never thought, I mean, I never thought of myself as doing this. Um, yeah. But I think as dancers, I kind of have said this a, a lot before. Um, when you go to school for dance or you grow up dancing, there's not one trajectory of what you're going to do. Right. But if you go around, grow up wanting to be a doctor, you go to med school, you get a job being a doctor. That's pretty much... You know, or you play basketball and you're really good at it, like a competitive, you know, level and you go to college for basketball and you play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only, there's certain things that just have these one line trajectory where dance is kind of all over the place and you can do so much with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think hopefully like more so than I remember seeing when growing up, right? Like, Definitely. I don't know. I just remember thinking like, oh, if you want to be a dancer, well, there's not a lot of you know, money in that, unless you're, right. you know, prima ballerina or, right. you know, uh, in the movies or something. I mean, yeah. there's so many avenues now. And um, that to me is always like part of this conversation because anybody listening, like whether they're a dancer or they just love to dance, like you don't have to let go of that. There are other ways that you can continue to morph or find a new career or, you know, like you said, now you're using dance and fitness routines in your job, you right. know? So do you feel like what you do, like as a bodybuilder is a job? Like, is it, I know it's fun or, or like, okay. I, I, mean, think I mean, like, do you feel like it is a, um, I don't know. Yeah. Like occupation. Is it like a career? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, that makes sense too. Like yeah. in terms of, it's not just, um, it's not just a hobby. Right. No, like, Cause no, I think no. people look at that and they're like, wow, that you sacrifice a lot for, you know, just something you do on the weekends. You're like, no, this is a way of life. Like this is a lifestyle. Right. This is and my I, career. And it, is, it is, there are monetary, you know, compensations for it also. So it's not, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. No, I think, but I, I guess I say that because like that to me just furthers the, the commitment, right? It's like, right. um, cause there are people that just work out for fun. It's just kind of their hobby. It feels good. Um, but to and actually take it to the who, pro there level. There are people who compete for a hobby too. And they compete, you know, once a year, they compete on an amateur level or, you know, maybe they're professional, but they just do one because it's in their hometown and they like to do it yeah. and they like to get their body in shape, but there's just different levels. Right. And to take it to um, pro, I mean, like that's, that's a, that's a, an awesome commitment. I think, I mean, I'm only speaking for myself, but like, I think that's a real awesome commitment. So I have to say, I've seen other other and this is just from like social media yeah. and I've seen other like friends or acquaintances um that I've grown up with or like went to high, high school or college um who have kind of ventured into the same realm but yeah. to, 
but to actually see the different levels, right? And just how, just because you make the commitment to do it doesn't mean you're going to excel, you know, right. doesn't mean it's going to become a professional career for you. Um, I think just reinforces that the, the dedication, the, the physicality of it, mm-hmm. right? Like you said, the science behind it. Right. Um, Cause I've noticed like some people are like, yeah, I, I dieted, I restricted, I got into amazing shape. And then the minute you're done with competition, it's like binging, you know, all these unhealthy yeah. habits because I you're not to, really listening to your body. You know? well, I have to say, unfortunately, it is a stigma with the bodybuilding industry. And I think um, there are some people who just don't care and that's totally fine. But I do believe that the majority of people, there's two things. One, they're not educated on what's going to happen to your body after. Yeah. Um, and on the flip side, and then also they don't, they don't realize that they're not going to like the way they look and not be comfortable in their skin. And to me, that's very important as, you know, as a human, just feeling good in your own body. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that all coaches reverse competitors. So a lot of times a coach will say, okay, we have a 12 weeks, we have 12 weeks to start a competition. Here's your plan. Your plan, in my opinion, needs to still extend four to eight weeks after your competition. So it should be a 20 weeks, depending on where your competition is, give or take uh, weeks. I'm not really saying that's the definite time frame. Right. So you need to have at least two months with your coach after on plan. Whereas a lot of coaches are like, okay, you won your competition. Bye. All right. See you later. Good luck. Yeah. Well, and I wonder, like, that feels more supportive to have somebody with you after the competition. Because like you said, it's, maybe it's, it's not just about the competition. It's a lifestyle. It's, yeah. it might be a career, you know? And so to reinforce the like, hey, you did it. See ya. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. Where, where's the relationship in that? You know, where's right. the commit, where's the commitment to yourself in that? Right. So, right. Yeah. I think it's oversaturated as far as like coaches and everything is these days in our world with social media. So you have to find the right person. And I'm fortunate that I, you know, was approached by the right person. I just kind of fell into it. I did my research, but I fell into, you know, working with him and that really helped me. Yeah. So if anyone's looking for a coach, write me, DM me and we can, uh, I can send you his way. Yeah, totally. But, um, yeah, it's, it's very important to have proper guidance as I'm sure it is for any, any field. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, so I don't know, what are, what are your, I mean, I know COVID is still in the picture, but like, what are your, um, I don't even know how to put it. I don't know goals is the right word, but like, yeah. what are you, what do you think, what's in the future for you? Like, what are, yeah, what are so, your hopes um, for the, this, this new journey? So Olympia this past year, I placed fifth. That congratulations, by the thank way, it was thank amazing. You. Thank I, you. I only got to catch it like afterwards, but I watched the, oh, okay. you know, like the YouTube replay. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah. holy cow. <laughs> well, that's, um, very big. Um, so then I'm considered fifth in the world, which is pretty cool. Um, so the next competition will be the Arnold Classic, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger's show in Ohio in September. Hopefully it happens. Yeah. Um, so goals for me are to win that um, and then go into Olympia again, which I believe is going to be December again. Everything's kind of up in the air. Yeah. So winning that would be another goal of mine. Um, top three would be a goal also. Um, and... I think just continuing to grow in the industry, make a name for myself is really important for me, but in a way that I'm comfortable with. And Mm -hmm. I uh, think I look up to a lot of competitors that have the same mentality as I do and have grown in that way, as opposed to how some of the other people do it. Um, So staying, staying true to myself, I think in, in a respectful way, as far as everyone else, you know, the, the fitness industry is very oversaturated and sex sells and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So staying true to who I am and being very real on social media and gaining more acknowledgement that way. And yeah, you know, just helping people through social media. I think my, my business has grown a lot due to COVID, which I am very, very thankful for. Um, I never thought personal training virtually would be a thing. Mm-hmm. So I've had... I think almost like 15, maybe 20 new clients virtually. Wow. Um, 
So I'm very thankful for that and helping people and inspiring people to get healthier and feel better and like the way they feel in their clothes and their body and learn, educate them on food. Those are big goals of mine, re-educating people on food and nutrition and exercise. Yeah. And, um, you know, you hit the nail on the head that like social media can be such a great way for people to connect, right? Like I was mentioning at the beginning, it's how I've connected, maybe not even intentionally, but just like stayed in contact with people I grew up with or have like kind of, you know, known since I was a kid, but, um, but it can also have detrimental impacts too, right? Like you said, from the fitness, I mean, I see, I don't always consider myself in the dance industry, but being a dance therapist on social media, there, there are these like natural connections that start to happen where it's like, oh, well, you have the word dance or you hashtag right. dance. So you start to see the dance world and there's some beautiful things to see. And there's some really harmful things to see too. And right. like you said, it, it is about being authentic and really following your voice, not what you see. And that's, yeah, it, it's hard. Think, it's really, yeah, really it's hard. Very hard. I think we constantly compare and contrast ourselves to others and I always, always say to everyone, don't believe anything you see on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good place to start. It's not even some things, just don't believe anything. Yeah, I, I forgot what it was. It was during the summer, during COVID, and I, I think I posted something like on a beach in Mexico. My friend was like, you're in Mexico? And I was like, never believe Instagram. Right. <laughs> Right. Granted, to that, I have to say on the flip side, I try to be really, really honest and I don't use like any filters on my face or alter my pictures any. Yeah. Do I hold my phone at a great angle? Sure. But <laughs> right. I, Who doesn't? I, 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 yeah. Do I take a hundred <laughs> selfies before I post one? Sure. But I also try to post stuff where, you know, I don't have the best angle or mm. I, my hair's a mess or I just look like me. Yeah. Um, so I think really focusing on yourself and your positives are imp- really important. Yeah. Yeah. We, we constantly beat ourselves up and it's just not helpful at all. Yeah. Yeah. In so many different ways too. Yeah. Um, talk about, is it Forza? Is that yes, the name yeah. of your company? Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. So during the beginning of COVID, um, my college friend and I, We've always been close, but we kind of were like both bored at home, both single, living alone. So we started FaceTiming a lot. Mm -hmm. She's out in LA and she's um, a yoga instructor and she's also a business major. And she's like, have you ever thought of like a fitness, um, like equipment or something to sell or brands? And I was like, yeah, sure. I always have, but I don't have that business background or that kind of, my brain doesn't think like that. And she's like, why don't I do business side? And you do the whole fitness side. So we came out with our bands um, that are hip circles. And um, we did all the research from like March to May, Mm -hmm. I think. We just kind of were like, let's see what happens. Let's just get our brains together. And we ended up coming out with our with our own branded bands. They're they're called Forza Resistance Bands, and mm-hmm. they're used for glute activation. They're used for um, any kind of leg exercise. You can add them to your workouts. And we ended up, I think, launching in August, if I remember correctly. Maybe. I know, time. I know like, there's time. no time in I'm the land sure. of COVID. <laughs> I'm like, last um, week, so two months ago, I don't know. Well, yeah, and we have um, new products coming out hopefully um fall i'm sorry no spring spring um and we just started like a little fitness accessory line and it's been great yeah that's so cool i mean again like on etsy or just through myself okay yeah and actually when i upload this video i'll um i'll put the link so okay great um yeah and any contact information you want i can also put in there as well but so if people are interested um they can just they can go to the website but uh yeah isn't it crazy i mean um I, like COVID has definitely been challenging on so many different levels. And yet I feel like there are silver, silver linings, you know, like yeah. even people who have had the most horrific, tragic experiences are, are finding some way to find a silver lining. And so, like you said, the fact that I thought going virtual would leave my business, it would I don't know what that would do for business. And the fact that it goes virtual and more clients are interested, right. Or telehealth, like 
I mean, we know mental health is very needed, but the fact that people are actually jumping on, like that's a big deal. So it's, it's, you know, the fact that like you could start a business during COVID while other people are losing their businesses. It's, you just never know, you know, to have this, like, to, to not come at it from a scarcity mentality, but to have this, like, what if, right? Like the potential. Well, I think it also stems back. I can, I always, always, not even just for this interview, but it all goes back to dance. Cause to me, it was, I was like, oh crap, what now? Like I was actually laid off from my job as a trainer. I've never been laid off. I've never been fired, you know, anything like that. And I, they said to me indefinitely, I said like two weeks and they were like, no, indefinitely. I was like, mm-hmm. I, was like I know what that word means, but like, what do what? you mean by Does that not word? compute, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think it goes back to my dancing where it was like, you gotta hustle, you gotta find something to do and the discipline in me when she said that to me, I was like, okay, what do you need me to do? You tell me what you need me to do. I'll tell you what I need you to do. And we got it done. Yeah. And I think that so much of my life, I had to be on ballet, at time, ballet on time. I had to have my hair in a bun. I couldn't wear jewelry. I had to be dressed correctly. So I had all these disciplines in my life for years. Yeah, that's that's so true. I'm like that. Thank you for bringing it back to dance. <laughs> yeah, I think I always, honestly, even besides this interview, I always say that, you know, I, I just think I always tell people to get their kids in some activity that's more than once a week to, you know, to, to preach health and discipline. And I don't think that my ballet training was too strict. I don't think the fact that I couldn't enter a class if I was late, I think I'm never late anywhere. Yeah. So, you know, growing up, I couldn't, I don't know if you had Mr. Richard at all for ballet, but. I did for like dance camp one summer. Okay. So <laughs> and I, you know what? I didn't remember that until you said that. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, if we missed the first exercise, was plies of ballet bar, we weren't allowed in class. Mm-hmm. So to this day, it's rare that I'm late somewhere. I'm usually five to 10 minutes early, even with the subways in New York city that don't always run. Yeah. So, um, it's so true. I, yeah, I just like had a little bit of a, like, Oh, wow. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, you bring up a good point because I think now more than ever we're, we're like, we've gone to the extreme, right. Where it's kind of like anything goes like, well, at least you're here. Things are going up 35 minutes late. Right. Right. All like, there's got to be a balance, you know, yeah. to find some type of like discipline, or I guess I hear the word responsibility, right? Like, right. can you be responsible? And then if you show up late, then you take responsibility for showing up late and you miss that class, you know? Um, okay. This is totally off topic, but I have to ask new, oh, cause my earbud comes out. Um, new York, Florida. Ugh. You know, it's so funny. <laughs> I only know New York as an adult. Okay. That makes and sense. I only know Florida as a kid. I left Florida at 18. Yeah. So I went from Florida at 18 to Arizona from 18 to what is it? 22. And then I moved straight to New York. So I've been here 16 years. Okay. So this is the only place I know as home as an adult. I hate the winter. I hate to use that <laughs> word, but I hate it. Like we, I, I haven't stopped snowing. I don't think I've ever seen this much snow in my entire life. I know. I think you're getting what we, cause I'm in Chicago. I think you're getting oh, what right. we had like the last two days. It's yeah. Kind of, yeah. It just keeps coming. It just and keeps I am coming. always cold. People just like make fun of me all the time. So, um, <laughs> weather wise, I, I <laughs> Florida, definitely, definitely Florida. Florida. But then I don't know. Cause the spring is so beautiful here. Um, the summer is the same as Florida. It's okay. It's you don't hot. have to choose. I'm glad my parents are still there. So I you don't have to choose. Visit. Yeah. Um, one you know, I don't, I don't really get to go back to Florida. So I grew up in New Jersey. Right. Then I moved to Florida and then like uh, adolescent high school, like moved to Chicago. So I don't really, I have fond memories of everywhere for whatever reason, like Florida always stuck with me. I just like, I found what it's only my experience, but like moving into the community, like complete strangers reached out to us um that didn't really yeah. happen in other places i so love i always remembered that i love tampa um and tampa's in the super bowl i'm right, so excited right, about that so it's awesome. yeah. i do have to say i think i have become a bit of a new yorker for better or worse okay um as far as like my patience level 
that as a fast mover to begin with, born that way, always been quick. Um, but I, well, I, like, I go back to Florida, the Starbucks lady, I'm like, black coffee. And she's like, now, please. And I'm like, but it tastes like, I don't even want anything <laughs> in it, just <laughs> the coffee. Yeah. So, I mean, New York is much faster than Chicago, but I remember moving to Chicago and maybe like four or five years later, going back to Florida and visiting some family and friends. And I had the same reaction. I was like, man, everything's so slow here. And it's not even that fast in Chicago because we're right. slow, you know, but- well, New York is like a whole different animal. So for me to go oh, totally. anywhere, it's like people are moving like molasses. So I kind of <laughs> have to remind myself and like take a breath and relax. Yeah. 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 But I got, I, yeah. I like oh, that I've only known New York as an adult. So I feel like I have to say New York. Yeah. But New York's so great. I mean, it's been yeah. a while since I've like actually lived there, but I remember growing up in New Jersey and always going into the city and it is kind of this larger than life, you know, feeling. And um, I don't know. I mean, I just like, I just had to ask because they're yeah. very different, very, very <laughs> different. different. Right. And then, yeah, when you're among all the snow, you're like, oh, I, I wish really I love could, to be I in Florida. That I wish I could winter in Florida. <laughs> be a snowbird, yeah. Like, I could be a snowbird in like my 30s and go to Florida <laughs> for the winter and then come hey, back. Anything's Apparently, possible. Apparently, I can now with my with my virtual training. With your so COVID, yep, yep. Maybe it's a thing. <laughs> there you go. I, I wouldn't disagree with that, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I the, the funny thing is like, so I went back very briefly, I was like, I'm going to go back to Florida. And I actually went to the University of Florida just for my freshman year of college, which actually was the reason I found dance movement therapy. So that was actually a really good thing. Yeah. But um, I remember coming back to Florida and in the mornings walking to um, the ballet, uh, the ballet, going to take ballet or dance class, walking to the basketball stadium it's like 35, 40 degrees out. And I was in a short sleeve t-shirt because I was like, this is warm. Yeah. <laughs> That's not me ever. I had, I had gotten used to like, you know, our kind of vortex, like minus 20 at some winters. Not, that's not the norm, but um, your skin, your blood thins very quickly though. Yeah. So I think by the, you know, by the next winter, I was, it was not that warm for me. Anymore. Right. right. Anyway. So yeah, I, I'm with you like good and bad. Um, I, I hands down I'm always like New York pizza to me is the top so yeah if anything I got you know go back to New York just for that <laughs> pretty good too it's not bad it's not bad not I, I like it I've gotten used to it yeah. but uh but New York, I, don't I, have to grow up on pizza. It. I think there's I think there's <laughs> all pizza's good <laughs> all pizzas belong in my life that's how I feel. see you heard it from a top yeah. five competitor yeah. in the Olympia. Chicago, Pizza's good. New York, Detroit. <laughs> and then there's that category for fast food pizza, like Domino's. And, uh, <laughs> right. They all go together. They're all good. They're all good. Yeah. So where can people find out more about you? Like how can we connect with you or stay connected to your- Yeah, I think the best way is Instagram, um, Jacqueline NYC. So J-A-C-L-Y-N NYC is my Instagram. Um, Facebook, Jacqueline Baker. Um, and then I do have a website and it's my name, Jacqueline M. Baker. Um, so I think those are the top ways to keep in contact with me. Like I said, Instagram, probably the where I'm most active as far as posting and, and sharing and things like that. Great. Thank you so much for being willing to, to come on and of just have, a, so have an awesome conversation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm like just so in awe and inspired by your journey. And um, I just, yeah, look forward to continuing to, to watch. I mean, it's kind of the creepy thing about social media, you yeah. know, it's like, I can't, I keep watching and then it's like, but we don't, we don't always talk. You right? right, like, right, right, time right. I actually got to talk. So yeah, no, hopefully really, that's not too creepy, but um, not at all. I appreciate it's it. It's really exciting. And um, yeah, hopefully and we'll just keep, keep in touch and um, yeah. If there's anything that, that the dance movement therapy community could do for you, let us know. <laughs> awesome. I love what you're doing. So I, I think it's great. I Thanks. Think, and it can really help people. And I wish it was around when, you know, I was younger. Right. Like, I, I, mean, I didn't even know about it. Ironically, it has, it's been around for a long time, but I didn't even find out about it until I was in college. So, right. um, you know, I think that's not that young people will be watching this, although it'll be accessible to them. But I think for for young dancers to know that like you have so much at your disposal. You right. could be 
a doc, you know, a, a dance psychologist, you can yeah. be top, you know, you can be a top bodybuilding competitor. Um, just, it doesn't have to look one way. Just like yeah. you said, that like that linear avenue, it can look a lot of different ways from a dance perspective. I so. think that's the, the biggest thing that I think bodybuilding has actually taught me. Yeah. You know, is that it, it doesn't look the same for everyone. It doesn't have to. Yeah. And, you know, in some way or shape or form, I feel like we've kind of alluded to the fact that whether it's dance, whether it's bodybuilding, like just moving through your life keeps you moving, right? Like moving physically keeps you moving mentally. Yeah. So especially through COVID, like I'm sure that your, your clients, your family, like they're probably so grateful that they have you to keep them moving through this really, really challenging time. Yeah. And I'm grateful for them. So it's, it's yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Stay Thank warm. You for having me. You're welcome. And, um, yeah, we'll keep in touch. Uh, take okay, care, you. stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see each other soon. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye.